Good afternoon and welcome to Nature's Returns, Investing in Ecosystem Services, a webinar series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Amy Torget and I will be your host for today's presentation. The Nature's Returns webinar series addresses the growing importance of ecosystem service valuation and investment. Each presentation is recorded and available from CBay through YouTube and on the Yale iTunes U channel. Today, we are super excited to be talking about financing mechanisms for the restoration and health of forests with our guests, Lee Madeira and Natalie Woolworth. Lee is a co-founder and partner at Blue Forest Conservation, a mission-driven firm committed to creating investments that are both environmentally and financially sustainable. Supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and in partnership with Encourage Capital and the World Resources Institute, Blue Forest recently launched its first innovative finance mechanism, the Forest Resilience Bond. Prior to founding Blue Forest, Lee researched energy investment opportunities in the equity and fixed income markets at Hotchkiss and Wiley Capital Management, worked as a financial analyst at the shareholder activism firm Relational Investors, and was an investment banking analyst for Credit Suisse. Lee earned an MBA with honors from UC Berkeley Haas School of Business, holds a BBA in finance from the University of Notre Dame, and is a CFA charter holder. Our second guest is Natalie Woolworth. In a joint role between the U.S. Forest Service and key agency partner Blue Forest Conservation, Natalie works to accelerate the pace and scale at which the U.S. Forest Service can conduct, can conduct forest restoration to reduce wildfire risk on national forests and adjacent landscapes through the Forest Resilience Bond model. Prior to joining the Forest Service, Natalie helped nonprofit organizations to more effectively achieve their missions as a management consultant and worked with a community land trust in Maine to conserve and manage private land. Natalie holds a Master of Environmental Management from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a BA in Cultural Anthropology from Bates College. We are very excited to have them both here today and we welcome Natalie back to Yale. During today's webinar, Lee will kick off the presentation providing some background on Blue Forest and the Forest Resilience Bonds and then speak to their exciting new pilot project that they recently launched this fall, which I'm personally looking forward to hearing about. And then Natalie will speak about the bond in the context of the U.S. Forest Service's challenges and goals and how they're thinking about scaling this innovative financing tool. After the presentation, we are hoping to leave a fair amount of time for Q&A, so please make sure to submit all your questions and we can have an in-depth discussion with Lee and Natalie. You can type your questions in the Q&A section of your screen throughout the presentation. We will collect them and I will present them to our guests at the end of the presentation. All right, let's get started. Lee? Great, thanks so much, Amy. Can everyone hear me okay? I'll take that as a yes. Um, Amy and Paul, thank you so much for organizing this and thank you everyone for dialing in this morning on the um, West Coast and this afternoon over on the East Coast. So um, again, my name is Lee Madeira and I'm at Blue Forest Conservation. One of my partners, Zach, he actually did one of these webinars about a year ago where he talked about what the Forest Resilience Fund was and, and how it worked. And so we wanted to take a slightly different angle here, especially now that we recently launched our first pilot project. So I'm gonna be spending most of my time talking specifically about the case study of our recent pilot project um, in Tahoe National Forest, but I realize that not everyone on the line might have the background that they need to understand what the Forest Resilience Bond is. So I'm gonna kick off with a short video that we just had made that describes what the Forest Resilience Bond is and hopefully just gives a little bit of, of context, context before we dig into the case study. So Amy, if you would, could you cue up the video, please? So here's how the Forest Resilience Bond works. Let's say a land manager, like the Forest Service, has identified a needed forest restoration project. The projects may include mechanical thinning, prescribed burns, and other activities specially designed to restore health to an overgrown forest and reduce wildfire risk. The Forest Service has already completed the required plans, approvals, and environmental permitting. Unfortunately, with the budget the Forest Service has for this project, it would take years to complete, if at all, and the forest is at immediate risk for severe and destructive wildfire. The worry is that a wildfire may occur at any moment, damaging the forest, the water supply, and surrounding communities long before the project can be completed. 
Enter Blue Forest, a team of financial and scientific experts focused on financing large-scale forest restoration. Working with the Forest Service and the World Resources Institute, Blue Forest helps to identify potential project stakeholders, utilities, private companies, and other organizations that can realize value from the restoration project. For this example, let's say that in addition to the Forest Service, a water utility, the state government, and a beverage company are also very interested in seeing this project completed. Each also has some available funding, but not nearly enough to complete the entire task on its own. Blue Forest works with each contributing beneficiary to set up contracts that pay for a portion of restoration costs over time that together cover all the funds needed for the project, plus a modest return for the investors. Blue Forest also identifies an implementation partner. This organization will be the one responsible for contracting the restoration work on the ground. Blue Forest looks for an experienced and knowledgeable nonprofit that knows this forest and has relationships with the Forest Service and community stakeholders. Then, Blue Forest packages these contracts together to establish a Forest Resilience Bond, also known as the FRB, which is made available to private investors. These investors can include large pension funds or insurance companies, or mission-driven groups like foundations and impact investors that want to invest in local communities while diversifying their portfolios. And in order to avoid any potential conflicts of interest, investors don't have any say on the what, how, or where of the restoration work funded by the FRB. Next, private investment funds the FRB. And the FRB funds are spent through the implementation partner to complete the restoration project. Over time, the contributing beneficiaries repay the FRB based on the value they've received from the restoration project as agreed to in their contracts with Blue Forest. Third-party monitoring and verification occurs throughout the life of the project to measure these benefits and to ensure that the work is completed. In the end, wildfire risk is reduced now, not later. The contributing beneficiaries have achieved their goals, and we all enjoy the benefits of a healthy forest, clean air to breathe and water to drink, places to recreate, and habitat for wildlife. The Forest Resilience Bond is an innovative public-private partnership opportunity that proactively invests in forest health before it's too late. So here's how. Great. Thanks, Amy. So hopefully that gives uh, some background to the Forest Resilience Bond. And of course, if there are any questions, we're happy to go into more detail on any of that in the Q&A section. But we really wanted to spend the majority of our time today talking about a specific example of this now that we have launched our first pilot project. So just last month, we announced um, a $4.6 million project in the North Yuba watershed, which is in Tahoe National Forest of Northern California. The project itself is $4.6 million. The amount that the FRB will be financing is up to $4 million. Um, and I can go into more detail on that if, if anyone has any questions on why there's a difference there. And um, what we're talking about here, this is this map shows the, um, shows the, the treatments that were prescribed by the Forest Service. So we're talking about mostly um, prescri prescribed burns and some thinning of trees, as well as some meadow restoration and managing in invasive species, as well as a few other things. This was all done by the Forest Service in the, um, in the, the planning stage, which we were not involved in. Um, and this is across 7,000 acres. This, the work is 7,000 acres across a broader area of 15,000 acres. But as you can see, this is kind of one small part of, of the broader watershed, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, next slide, please. So the reason why we are talking about this restoration work and why this was so high priority for the Forest Service and for our stakeholders is because this map shows the wildfire risk. And as you can see, there's a lot of red. Uh, when, we, when we did our analysis, we saw that there's a greater than 50% chance of a large catastrophic fire in the area over the next 30 years. And that risk had actually tripled in just a six year period. So um, this was done in the analysis was in 2008 and then again in 2014. And in that six years, the fire risk had tripled. And of course, 2014 is now four years old. So when we say the fire risk is at least 50%, over the next 30 years, it's likely even much higher than that now. And that's really not a surprise because this is only 50 miles from Paradise, which is where the campfire happened. And the campfire, as you may know, ended as, as, the, as the deadliest and most destructive fire in California's history. So this really is an area that um, is, in, is in need of restoration work to help 
um, get rid of some of this red on the map in terms of the fire risk. Next slide. So I wanted to give a little bit of context as to how this project came together. Uh, we've been working, uh, my, my co-founders and I started Blue Forest almost four years now. And so this has been a long time coming and took a lot of relationships and um, building up to this point. So in terms of how the Forest Resilience Fund works, we start by having the beneficiaries come to us with a project that, that needs funding. And that's exactly what happened here, working with the Forest Service and the Sierra Nevada Conservancy they we we asked them what they thought might be a good project for the forest resilience bond and they pulled out a map and pointed to to the north Yuba watershed here in the tahoe national forest so then once they did that we thought about who the broader beneficiary group would be and in step two we talked with each of those beneficiaries to figure out what is success for them uh, and and make sure that we can incorporate that into into our contracts so for all of our beneficiaries, success for them was pretty consistent and pretty simple, just getting the restoration work done. And that brings us to step three, where we worked with um, all the beneficiaries, which I should probably tell you, it's, um, so it's the Forest Service, it's also the State Government of California through a few different grant programs, as well as Yuba Water Agency, which is the local water and electric utility uh, that really wanted to, to see a restoration project happen in their watershed. So we worked with those three beneficiaries to figure out not just what success is, but how can we write up contracts and agreements that work for them and, and make sure that we are um, capturing their goals. And then in step four, we take those contracts to investors of course, we've been we've been engaging with investors this whole time, but we don't actually take any commitments from investors or um, or sign any contracts with them until everything has really been buttoned up with the beneficiaries and and everything has been planned and ready to go. So then we we get the investors to provide upfront capital, and I'll be talking a little bit more about the investors in a minute. And then we start to give the money to the implementation partner in step five. So uh, the way that this is structured, it's actually a, a loan, not a bond. And we have about four years that we can call on that loan. So the implementation work will happen over the next three to four years. And as we need the money, we, we call it from investors and we pass that on to the National Forest Foundation, who is our implementation partner. And then in step six, as the, as, as the implementation is taking place, we have evaluators that are that are measuring the benefits and making sure that the restoration work has happened according to plan. And that is then what prompts the beneficiary payments in step seven. Um, so steps five, six, and seven, because the implementation doesn't happen overnight, they're often happening at the same time. So evaluators might be evaluating restoration work that has happened a few months ago, and that's prompting payments from the beneficiaries while the implementation partner is still carrying out new restoration work. So this is kind of ongoing over, over a few years. And then also ongoing throughout that period, the investors are repaid. So as the beneficiaries make payments back to the FRB, we immediately pass those back on to investors. And the whole project is um, going to be finished and investors will be repaid within five years. Next slide, please. So for this just gives uh, this chart just kind of gives you a little more of the flow of funds. So the last slide showed you how the project came about in terms of how we worked with the different stakeholders. So this flow of funds is now that we have all the contracts and agreements buttoned up. This is really how kind of the legal structure works. So I'm actually going to start in the middle here with FRB Yuba Project One LLC, which is the very catchy name that we came up with for our LLC. Um, so those of you who are familiar with financial structuring. When you do project specific financing, it's really important to have a separate legal entity for each project. So we created an LLC specific for this Yuba project um, that is actually managed by a nonprofit that we just created called Blue Forest Finance. Um, it's managed by a, a non it managed by a nonprofit for tax reasons, which um, is a result of the the recent tax law. Um, which, if anyone wants to nerd out on um, on interest expense and tax deductibility later, we certainly can. But um, it is important to note that we did set up a nonprofit to own this LLC. Otherwise, there would have been a lot of uh, unintended tax consequences. So Blue Forest, as a nonprofit, manages this, this LLC. And then um, I will just back up and start back at the top. So now that we have this SPV set up, what happens is investors give money to 
specifically to the special purpose vehicle, this LLC that we set up. We then pass that on down to the National Forest Foundation to do the implementation work. And again, this is happening over the course of a couple of years as the implementation is happening. And then in terms of how investors get paid back, that's, those are the, the boxes on the edges here. So we also have agreements and contracts with the Forest Service, with the state government of California, and with the Yuba Water Agency. And they all are providing different levels of funding to, to pay for parts of the project and to reimburse investors. And as you'll see, some, so Yuba Water Agency, they were, they were fine with signing a contract directly with our LLC that we set up. But for the state of California and for the Forest Service, that really had to go through NFS first. So um, that's something that, that could change in the future. We hope to be signing agreements directly with the Forest Service instead of having to go through NFS. But um, it was really important to kind of make sure that we could create something that was workable legally and contractually for all the parties. Um, so that's kind of just the flow of funds, investors to the LLC, to the NFS. And then to get the money back, it's coming from the Forest Service in the state and the the, the Yuba Water Agency. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, in terms of the investors, so we raised $4 million. It's $1 million each from four of these investors. We have the Rockefeller and Moore Foundations. Both have provided grant capital to help us get to this point. Um, and they also provided program-related investments in this pilot project. So they uh, are getting a 1% return, which is below market rate return, but it counts towards their 5% of grant making. And then on the, the market rate side, they're getting about a 4.5% return. We have Calvert Impact Capital, which is an impact investor that many of you have probably heard of, as well as CSAA, which is part of AAA Insurance. It's really exciting to have the insurance company on board because they, last year in the Northern California wildfires, CSA lost a lot of money insuring homes. Jury is still out in terms of how much they're gonna be losing this year in terms of the wildfire season. So for them, it's really a win-win because not only on the investment side do they get a market rate of return and portfolio diversification, but when you look at the underwriting side for their insurance, doing projects in areas where they have customers decreases the risk of a fire even happening for their customers in the first place. So they can tell their customers, you know, not only will we cover you in the case of a fire, but we are actively using your premiums to decrease the risk of that fire happening in the first place. So uh, really exciting to have an insurance company on board, kind of seeing the, the multiple benefits of investing in something like this. And we've actually had a lot of interest from other insurance companies as well. So we're starting to, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to ramp up our engagement with the insurance industry because as I'm sure you can imagine, they manage a lot of money. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Next slide, please. Okay, so really just wanted to, to spend a couple minutes reflecting on, on the pilot project. Of course, the, we will be learning a lot over the next few years as the implementation and all the repayments happen. But in terms of just getting to the point where everyone signed a contract and we're ready to, to kick things off, um, wanted to just kind of reflect on that and, and share some, some lessons learned for other people who might be doing this type of work. So first, I just want to start with the goals of the pilot project. The, one of the main goals is to get the restoration work done and get it done faster. So we were told by the Forest Service that, you know, they were planning this project on their own. Um, they might have, they could have pursued it without the Forest Resilience Bond, but it probably would have taken them more like 10 years to get this project done. And that's, that's budget depending. We are, our implementation plan is closer to four years. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the fire risk in this area tripled over a six year period. So being able to condense that implementation timeframe from 10 years to four years or 10 years, if at all, to four years actually make, makes a huge difference. So that's one of our main goals here. Our second is to demonstrate that these groups can collaborate. I mean, we have an impact investor, a foundation, an insurance company. We have a water and electric utility, a federal agency, showing that all these groups all have common interests that we can codify through contracts and that everyone can work together. I think that's, that's a huge part of demonstrating success. And then finally, showing that what's good for the planet can also be good for your portfolio. That's what we're doing right now in terms of getting the restoration work done and repaying investors. And so if at the end of these five years, the restoration work has been done successfully and the investors get their money back plus the promised return, then that really shows that we can, uh, we can do both what's good for the planet and also what's good for investors' portfolio. Next slide, please. 
And then in terms of what we look for uh, in, a, in a project, what we look for in this UBA project, and then also for while we're evaluating new projects, the first is that it, it has to be pretty much shovel ready. And what I mean by that is I mentioned the, the planning that the Forest Service had done. We did not have any role in the planning of the restoration work uh, at, you know, at Blue Forest or any of our, any of our partners. Um, it's not our expertise, and also we want to make sure to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest. So all of the work that has been prescribed to be done in the forest is what is best for the environment, what's best for the, what's best ecologically. It's not what's best for some of our necessarily for our stakeholders or our investors. We want to make sure that that we keep um, that we keep that separate. And the next is that the in terms of bottlenecks, it, the main bottleneck needs to be financial. And what I mean by that is. When we look at some areas, they have some areas of the country, the, the forest, they, they have a good amount of money, but they don't have any planned projects or they don't have any implementation capacity. So we could try to do a forest resilience bond there, but giving them upfront capital from investors isn't going to help them if the bottleneck isn't financial. The next is we're looking for discrete beneficiaries that are both willing and able to pay. So in really remote areas where the only beneficiary might be the forest service, that's probably not going to be the best application of the forest resilience fund. But in this, in this case where we have the state government involved, where we have a local water and electric utility involved, um, in addition to the forest service and all of those beneficiaries are willing and able to pay, that's really what, what makes this come together. The next is an anchor tenant. I can't tell you how important it is to have uh, one anchor tenant be really before doing most of your stakeholder outreach. When we talk to the water agency, when we talk to the implementation partner, uh, anyone about this project, they say, well, what does the Forest Service say? Is the Forest Service on board? And once we got the Forest Service on board, and the Forest Service might not always be the anchor tenant, but um, it, it will be most of the time, I'm assuming. Once we have the anchor tenant on board, it really makes bringing those other groups on so much easier. The next is what I call a Goldilocks size. So we don't want it to be too small. We don't want it to be too big. The reason why we don't want it to be too big is because this is a pilot. We want to make sure that we're not getting ahead of ourselves and that if any problems arise, that that happens on a smaller scale rather than a bigger scale. But we also don't want it to be too small because this is a lot of work to put these together. We want to make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze. And also from an investor standpoint, um, you know, we, we had to cut our investors back to a million dollars each. They actually wanted to, to give us more because the due diligence that they have to do is the same whether they're giving you 500,000 or $5 million. And so um, it's actually could be harder to finance a project that's smaller because it's still the same amount of work and you don't get as much money out the door. And then finally, we look for something that sets a scale. So this is a $4 million project. We're really not gonna be successful in the long term if we do one $4 million project every three years. So we're looking to do pilots that then can, can be scaled in the same watershed with pretty much the same beneficiaries and the same contract. So again, if you remember that slide with the, with the restoration area that was, that was in that, that top right corner, it's just one part of the watershed. And all of our stakeholders are interested in doing this on a small scale now to test it out, but then doing it on a much bigger scale in a couple years to do landscape scale watershed restoration. So that's, um, that's really something that we look for that even if it's kind of smaller now to test it out, that there's the potential to do this on a bigger scale in the future. Next slide, please. And um, I just wanted to, as we talk about scale, some anticipated challenges. The first is, as I mentioned, we, we think about bottlenecks a lot. Um, and while once we, once we get money invested in these forests, then we're going to start we're going to get rid of that financial bottleneck and we're going to start bumping up against some of the other bottlenecks. So planning is a big one, NEPA planning, um, as well as implementation capacity and what to do with the biomass that you remove from the forest. So those are all things that we are going to continue to bump up against and, and hope to kind of um, help, help all those markets grow and help enable larger projects by doing smaller ones first and kind of growing that way. The second is um, simply just, you know, as, as we get bigger projects, we're going to be asking for more money from our beneficiaries. So the water utility, you have a water agency, they're providing a million and a half dollars over the next five years. If we do a project 10 times the size, you know, we're going to be asking them for 10 times the money. That's going to be a harder ask. And of course, it's, it's going to be in their best interest. And that's, that's where we want to go with this. And that's where they want to go with this. 
But of course, that's going to be a more difficult conversation and it's going to be more difficult for our beneficiaries to, to make sure that they can, they can cover that larger ask. And then, um, excuse the not joke on the last one. I'm a child of the 90s, but I wanted to throw in one that was uh, surprisingly not a challenge to scale, and that is investor capital. Some of you might have might already know this, might already be experiencing this, but you know we're really fortunate that we got more interest in this pilot project than we could accommodate, and even the investors that we could accommodate, we had to cut back their allocations. We've gotten more interest from from people since announcing our our project, especially the insurance industry. So I think if we can if we can address these these first two, the the bottlenecks and the and getting the beneficiaries on board then the investor capital, I, I, I feel very confident, will be there. Next slide. Okay, this will be my last slide and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Natalie. Just a few, a few lessons learned from putting this together. The first is to make it innovative but boring at the same time. You know, there are a lot of things that we could have thrown in here, uh, carbon credits, pay for performance, new types of contracting with the Forest Service. We could have we could have asked the Forest Service to contract directly with uh, our LLC instead of through NSF, um, but we really wanted to make sure that we were conscious of how much how much innovation we were asking for. Um, so it needs to be new and exciting, but also it needs to be realistic. Um, and then also you want to pace yourself. This is why we're starting out with a small project, uh, a four million dollar project, and then hope to do a forty million dollar project in the future. And the next is to work within existing structures. So um, really what this means is in terms of relationships and contracting authorities. So when we talk to the Tahoe National Forest and ask them who they wanted to be their implementation partner on this, they said National Forest Foundation. NFF is, is very experienced, very knowledgeable. We were very happy to work with them. We, didn't want, we wanted to make sure that we didn't force another implementation partner on them. We wanted to work within structures and relationships that are already there. And then finally, you need to find your champions at each organization. I don't know where we would be if it weren't for Tommy and Jacqueline in the National Partnership Office, Sherry and Jason in Region 5, um, Willie at Yuba Water Agency, Mandy at Sierra Nevada Conservancy, all these people, you know, you, you can go to these groups and these, these organizations and tell them how great this is and how much impact this is going to have. But uh, having someone within their own organization advocate for you really just makes all the difference. So um, really important to kind of help identify people within these groups that can advocate for you and empower them to, to do that on your behalf. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's it for me. So I will pass it over to Natalie. Great, thank you, Lee. That was awesome. And thank you again, Amy and Paul, for the invite. Happy to be here. Um, so now that we've taken a more detailed look at first of our new pilot project in the Yuba River watershed, we're going to kind of zoom out and consider the implications of this model for the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little about the challenges the agency is facing and how the FRB can help the Forest Service to achieve our mission, which is to sustain the health of 193 million acres of forest grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. And yeah, not, Natalie, I don't. Natalie, you're you're cutting in and out a lot. It's hard to hear you. Oh no. Um, you sound a little better now. I don't know if you changed anything. I just moved my computer closer. Is this better? Yeah, that is better. Okay, I'll just keep it really close. Sorry about that. Um, we can go on to the next slide. That was just a little introduction. And Lee, let me know if if I start breaking up again, please. Uh, yeah, so no, you're, you're you're you sound good. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so first, to just set the context for why a tool like the FRB is needed, I want to talk a little about wildfire and how the growing risk of fire across the country is increasingly dominating the agency's work and our thinking about the future. So as I'm sure you all know, the frequency, size, and severity of wildfires is increasing, especially out west. Um, and this is for a number of reasons, um, rising temperatures, increasing drought conditions, and policies of fire suppression historically that have led to overcrowded forests with high amounts of hazardous fuels. Um, plus, we're seeing folks moving into sort of this wildland urban interface um, that is putting people increasingly, putting lives and property at risk. Uh, so at this point, the Forest Service has identified 58 million acres of National Forest System land as being at high risk of severe fire, uh, which is approximately a third of our acreage nationwide. 
And forest service leadership is no longer talking about fire seasons, we're talking about fire years, which means the threat of fire is extending beyond the boundaries of what we were accustomed to seeing. Uh, next slide. And there are other repercussions there too. So wildfire is increasingly impacting our financial picture um, as we spend an increasing portion of our annual appropriations on fire suppression. So as you can see from this diagram, in 1995, approximately 16% of the agency's budget was going to fire suppression. In 2015, it was 52%. Uh, in 2017, last year, it was 57%. This amount is rising. Um, so essentially, to fund the suppression of larger, more frequent fires, the Forest Service has been forced to raid our own budget, um, which is a problematic, very short-term solution we call fire borrowing. Although it's not actually borrowing, we're basically just taking the funds that should be spent on proactively improving forest health, among other activities, and we're putting those funds towards reactively fighting fires that are larger and larger in scale. Uh, so this ultimately leaves us with less available funding to put towards forest management activities that would reduce fire risk. Um, and those are the types of, of activities that the FRB funds. Um, so to give you a little bit of a sense of scale, we are facing a 30 to 45 year backlog of forest restoration work in California right now, where fire risk is quite high. Um, and a little bit of good news, Congress did pass legislation last spring called the Fire Funding Fix that will kick in in 2020 and provide seven years of financial assistance for fire suppression activities. Um, but this even is just a temporary partial solution. And even with the fix, the scale of restoration work that is needed across the country far exceeds what public resources can cover at this point and even philanthropic resources. So basically this context leaves us um, realizing that the Forest Service cannot have a business as usual mentality moving ahead. And next, next slide. Um, so there's, there's a growing recognition that large scale threats such as fire require large scale response through the Forest Service. Um, senior leadership are talking about, you know, how we can't move forward with business as usual mentalities. There are some new policy authorities that have been created to help us think about how to sort of go beyond the norm and do large scale cross boundary work. Um, and this summer, the Forest Service articulated a vision for shared stewardship that focuses on implementing work across federal, state, tribal, and private landscapes. So we're basically, as an agency, thinking really hard about how do we use all the tools in our wheelhouse, be it science, mapping, technology, partnerships, and in this case, finance, to achieve cross-boundary forest resilience. Um, so the FRB and other conservation finance work generally that the agency is pursuing uh, aligns with this ethic. Um, and these models provide us with, with new ways of doing business and thinking about how to build collaboration across landscapes and stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so how does the Forest Resilience Fund help us to accomplish our goals? Uh, some of this Lee touched on a little bit, but first and foremost, by providing upfront funding for forest restoration, the FRB increases the pace and scale at which we can accomplish this work, which is critical. Um, without the FRB, the Forest Service would be relying on annual appropriations to complete restoration work, which means we would have to undertake this work in very small increments over many years. Um, but with the FRB, we aren't dependent on annual funding cycles anymore. So as Lee noted with the Uber project, you know, work that would take the agency a decade or more to complete can be done in four years. Um, plus, we're sharing the cost of implementation with a variety of stakeholders and not shouldering it fully. Uh, secondly, the FRB gives the implementers of that, these activities some additional financial flexibility. So sometimes resources do exist to complete restoration work but it can be difficult to actually put those funds to work in a timely manner. And this is because a lot of public funding comes in the form of reimbursable grants, which means that implementation must actually be done before implementers are reimbursed. So for resource constrained nonprofits, which are oftentimes the groups actually doing this work on the ground, this can be a big hurdle. And getting the upfront funding in pocket allows work to happen more quickly and predictably. Um, over time. 
And then thirdly, as we discussed in the context of Yuba, the FRB brings together partners that might, might not otherwise work together. And she sort of listed off a number of those examples. But this framework of, of collaboration, um, it builds relationships that ex can extend beyond specific FRB projects and really work in the forest services behalf going forward as we think about cross-boundary landscape scale resilience. And then lastly, um, the pilot in Yuba that Lee discussed is not a cross-boundary project. The FRB model has the potential to encourage cross-boundary work by bringing diverse stakeholders to the table, um, which is an idea that really aligns with this vision of shared stewardship that we have at the Forest Service. Um, there may be additional complications to applying this model in a cross-boundary context that haven't necessarily been figured out, but it's an interesting path to pursue in, in future that could be really great for the agency. And next slide, please. So when it comes to conservation finance at the Forest Service, we really cut our teeth on the FRB. This was the first pilot project in the conservation finance space that we piloted. Um, and our work with Blue Forest Conservation over the last few years has really helped us as an agency to identify opportunities and barriers that apply to conservation finance work beyond the FRB. Um, and then it's also helped us to demonstrate proof of concept as we try to do more work in this area. Um, but ultimately, the goal of our conservation work generally at the Forest Service is it, we're always shooting to achieve scale both so that we can generate more impact towards the agency's mission, but also as a way to attract investors, specifically institutional investors that require large scale projects um, to consider investment more in like the 25 to $50 million range, as I think Lee mentioned earlier. Um, so to unlock sort of the full potential of conservation finance for the agency, um, our team is pursuing work in a three different areas, which all apply to the FRB specifically, as well as conservation finance work more generally. So we're thinking about how to identify landscapes that are ripe for this investment, um, which Lee discussed some of those criteria earlier, finding projects that are the right size, that lack funding. So there's really that, that gap in funding is the deciding factor, um, and then have beneficiaries available um, who are interested and able to, to pay back investors over time. And we're considering how do you put to use mapping tools and surveying and do ongoing work to build relationships with staff at all levels um, that help us identify what are the right places to work. And then secondly, we are thinking about how do you craft policy conditions that enable large scale private investment. Um, the conservation finance team at the Forest Service has clarified that the Forest Service is able to partner with private entities but we're not necessarily set up well to do that work, especially at scale. So we're proposing some new policy language that would facilitate that moving forward. And then lastly, we're always trying to build capacity around conservation finance at the agency um, so that we have champions and folks with knowledge at all levels in all geographies to help move this work forward. Um, but really our work with Blue Forest Conservation, as I said, this is sort of where we cut our teeth um, and this has been a true partnership for the last few years, but it, it's helped us, our work with Blue Forest has helped us in all of these areas. Um, you know, Blue Forest has been out in the field talking to a range of Forest Service staff and building confidence and knowledge and expertise in these important areas. Um, and now there's a pilot that's up and running in Yuba, which demonstrates proof of concept and has generated a lot of excitement internally. Um, and so now we're moving forward with, with all those wins under our belt, which is really exciting. And with that, I think next, that was my last slide. So I think we'll move to any time left. Um, some questions from you all. Thanks so much for tuning in. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much um, to Lee and Natalie for that really great presentation, super engaging, super interesting. And you guys are kind of on the frontier of this field. So it's really wonderful to have you on. So just as a quick reminder to our listeners, you can type questions in the Q&A section of the screen and I will direct them to our guests. Um, so first off, this will be a question for, um, for Lee. 
So we have an audience member uh, wondering, what are some examples of success metrics for beneficiaries? You mentioned that at the beginning of your presentation. So can you maybe provide some examples of the success metrics um, for beneficiaries in order to pay back investors? Yeah, absolutely. So for the Yuba project, it's pretty straightforward. It's just based on completing, successfully completing the restoration work. And that's actually how most of this, most of these contracts and work would happen even without the FRB. So if, if National Forest Foundation were to get money to do a restoration project, they would pay those contractors based on them doing the restoration work and um, the Forest Service coming in and acknowledging that the work has been done according to plan. So that's kind of the first and, and most basic. And when we think about pay for, pay for performance, you know, pay for outcomes versus pay for output, uh, the, successful rest, the successfully restored acreage is more of an output. Um, and, and that's how, you know, again, when I go back to my be innovative but boring at the same time, not trying to do too much at any one time, we decided to keep this first project solely focused on uh, rest, uh, getting the acres successfully restored as our, um, as our, our metric of success. Um, but we also are measuring um, through researchers at Sierra Nevada Research Institute. They will, be, they will be measuring how much additional water is created through this restoration work. And while that, doesn't, while that do, isn't tied to a specific payment, what, the reason why we wanted to do that is, well, first of all, because we wanted to know, but also because the, the water utility, the water agency, they said that they didn't want to tie any specific payments to outcomes in this first project and do any pay for performance but that when we do this on a bigger scale in another couple of years, that maybe they maybe that would be something that they would want to pursue. And so we're measuring it now so that we can go back and say, okay, if we had done a pay for, pay, pay for performance contract, this is what it would have looked like and this is what it would have meant for Yuba and for the investors. Some other examples include um, potentially including carbon credits. Uh, this is on federal lands, so it would have to be in the voluntary market but there's been a lot of progress in terms of the standards for carbon credits on forest restoration, um, as well as uh, also related to water sedimentation. So um, avoided sedimentation or um, even reduced sedimentation in water. So the main output for this project is just getting the acres restored, but there is a potential to add in some other metrics of success like carbon, water quantity, and sedimentation in the future. Great, thanks so much, Lee. And I just have a follow-up question for you as well. So we have a, you're wondering, this is kind of an interesting question. Um, you're wondering, you know, what happens if there is a fire in a restored area, kind of what's the liability associated with that and how does that fit into the bond? Is there any insurance or how do you think about that in the context of the FRB? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's something that, that we have thought about a lot. So. Um, you know, when, when it's a question of liability, it's, it, obviously it's a question of liability for whom. Um, for, our, for our investors, there's no liability for, um, for the Forest Service is not, you know, that's not really something that, um, that we have to worry about. Really, the way it works is the NFF as the implementation partner, they work with the restoration crews directly. And if there's anything that the restoration crews are negligent for any reason or any problems there, then the restoration crews are liable. If there's a fire that is through no fault of, of anyone, um, any of our stakeholders, then that just might mean that um, restoration doesn't, doesn't proceed on that specific area. Again, prescribed burns are part of this treatment. So um, depending on the fire, it, it might not be the end of the world. But um, the, the way that the financing works is we draw the capital as we need it, and we don't draw any additional capital until the capital that we've already drawn has been put to work, um, and that then triggers repayment. So if for some reason there is some sort of fire and there, um, that completely stops the project from moving forward, then it would, you know, instead of being a $4 million project, if we've only gotten $2 million of work done, then it would be a $2 million project. But there wouldn't be any risk to the $2 million that has already been deployed. It just means that the next $2 million um, might, not, uh, might not get called and might not get deployed if the project has to stop. 
but again, you know, a, a fire, um, a fire could actually be be part of the treatment plan and um, means that it, it could things could move along quite nicely. So it just depends. Hmm. Very interesting. Thanks for uh, getting into the nuances a little bit more. Um, awesome. So we also have another audience member um, wondering about, you know, how often do restoration treatments need to be repeated? Is that every 10 years, every number of years? You know, how is that considered in the FRB, especially thinking long term? Um, could either hear Lee or Natalie's viewpoint on that? Yeah, I, I'll get started here and then see if, if Natalie um, wants to add anything. Um, so yes, it's a good question. It's a good point. The restoration treatments do need to be repeated. And that actually is kind of an ideal scenario because the biggest risk and the hardest part is doing this the first time. And then once we have all the beneficiaries on board and the contract set up, if we just want to repeat this in another 10 years, then we actually can get for the same amount of money, we actually can get better results, ecologically speaking, um, and it's lower risk for investors because this has already been done and, and already the, the beneficiaries have already proven their ability to pay. So, um, you know, financially speaking, I think it, it's a big opportunity to recycle these investments. Um, and ecologically speaking, I think it, it's an opportunity to get a, a bigger bang for your buck um, and do this on a, on a bigger scale. Nally, do you have anything to add on the um, on the, the the treatment side? I mean, I think ultimately, I would also add that the costs of inaction accrue over time. So it's more expensive if we let the, the hazardous fuels build up over time. It's more expensive to deal with this work in future. So dealing with it as soon as possible um, has its own financial benefits. Great, thanks for that. Um, and then just um, kind of looking more globally, a few viewers are wondering, are, you know, are these sorts of projects also happening outside of the US and developing countries internationally? Um, Natalie, I would love to hear from you through your work. Have you encountered any sort of similar projects happening in forests outside of the US? And then would love to hear um, Lee's thoughts on whether she has ever thought about expanding outside of the U.S. Um, I'll start. I, I don't have a ton to say on this point. There, there are absolutely environmental impact bond models um, that folks are exploring in other content areas or other geographies. Um, the FRB specifically, this is the first pilot. Um, this is not something we've looked at in an international context at this point, and this is also something, you know, it's the first time the Forest Service has done anything like this, so no other specific examples to point to in that context. Yeah, I don't have a ton more to add here either. Um, you know, we, we could probably keep busy just in the state of California for the rest of our careers. Uh, we are looking at the, the broader Western U.S., so um, state of Washington, New Mexico, Colorado, so forth and so forth. Um, I think there is a potential to apply this model internationally and to a lot of other interventions as well. It doesn't just have to be fire. Um, and that's part of the reason why we do webinars like this and, and why we try to share a lot of the how this set up and, and the lessons learned. I don't know, you know, it would be great to get something like this going internationally. We'd be happy to help advise on that, but we also would want to make sure that there are local groups that really know know that environment best as the ones driving driving that forward. Great, thanks so much. And on that note, I think we're going to wrap up here um, since we're running out of time. But I'd really like to thank our speakers, Lee Madeira of Blue Forest Conservation and Natalie Woolworth representing both Blue Forest and the U.S. Forest Service for a really, really engaging discussion. I mean, this I think presentation and this discussion is especially relevant today and this fall due to the wildfires in California that we've all been following. And I think we're from Bay, we're excited to kind of see where the FRB goes in the next few years and excited to kind of track the pilot as well. Um, so thank you again. And just for our, um, our viewers, 
The recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube and iTunes channels, so please check back for those later. Um, and also be sure to check out the CBA website and newsletter for more information on upcoming webinars. And until next time, and on behalf of my co-host, Paul Hatanga, who is covering everything behind the scenes today, this was the Center for Business and the Environment, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.